special thing, and it, this is a surprise, okay? This is a surprise, because right here, well, I can do that afterwards, but right here, right here, at New Testament Christian Church, 349 North Avenue, in Greece, New York, number 14626, okay, live and in color, all the way from, and I wish I knew how to say the, the town I'm going, so I'll just say, all the way from China, okay, a big surprise for us is Deborah Alvarez is here, <laughs> hallelujah, so I didn't know this, I didn't know this was happening, so here she is, she likes to surprise us, how are you? We miss you so much. It's so good to see you. You want to say hi to everybody and tell hi them what's going on? Hi, guys. <laughs> Man, it's been forever, about a year, a little over a year. Um, wow, I am so excited to see you guys. Uh, I'll be here for the summer, um, and I'll be living in Lima, uh, but I'll be here for the rest of the month uh, to say hi to family, be with family and all that. But yeah, um, I'm going to be here for a time just to work on some growth things, get some healing, um, process some things. And uh, I really believe that uh, the Lord has just called me here just for a little while um, for the summer. Uh, and it'll equip me and just prepare me just to go back to the field and as uh, strong as ever um, and to continue with my study. Um, I'm still learning the language. I know quite a bit of Chinese now, which is pretty cool. Um, <laughs> Say something. Say something to us. <laughs> Come on. Say you love your pastor. Um, Tell everybody that in Chinese. What's uh, I will the pastor. <laughs> I don't know how to say <laughs> pastor in Chinese, but um, yeah, it's just it's just great to be here uh, amongst family and um, all my support, all you guys. Uh, I just really appreciate all just of your prayers, just your support for me, and um, just in this time, I really uh, feel blessed that I have this family with me. And so, um, yeah, it's good to see you guys. I'll continue to see your faces uh, here and there. I'll come home on weekends and uh, still see you guys now and then, so it'll be good. Um, yeah. Awesome, Deborah. We're so glad to see you. God, God bless you, everyone. Amen. Give her a big hand. That's awesome. So she's here for a little bit, and then going to go back <clears throat> to China again. She's just here for the summer. How come no one ever comes for the winter? Everyone always comes for the summer. So we're so glad to have you, Deborah. Really, we pray for you. We love her, and uh, we just continue to rejoice in all that God's doing in her life. Amen. Amen. All right. Bless the Lord. Well, let's get right into the Word of God, shall we? You want to hear from God this morning? All right, well, let's all stand together then, if you would, please. And we are going to go to Genesis chapter 3. And we're going to be reading the first eight verses. Okay, <clears throat> now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, or else you will die. <clears throat> and the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Let's just look to the Lord this morning. Father, we just want to thank you so much that you're in this place, that your spirit is here, Lord God, and your spirit leads us into all truth. Your spirit is our teacher today. And Lord, we're the students. We're the disciples. We're learned ones. God, we declare our total dependence on you today. That Lord, you need to show us. And we pray every eye would be open. And every heart would be receptive, God. We're ruling out every distraction, Lord. And we're not here today saying we've heard before. Or we know these things. Lord, we're saying today, teach us afresh. Teach us new, God. Teach us of your ways and lead us in the path of righteousness. We bless you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And amen. Thank you. You can be seated in the Lord's presence. <clears throat> so a home 
a home where the father is absent is on the rise in our society. Okay, it's, been, it's happening more and more. And the results have been documented. And the damage that's been done is irrefutable. So we covered some of that last week. We talked about that last week. If you were here with us, we, we looked over some actually these statistics. And when we examined that, we came to the rightful conclusion that fathers, now moms, you're very important. Moms, you're the nurturers, okay? It's mom's love that makes all the difference in our life. But we came to the conclusions that fathers, you are very powerful. You're a powerful influence in your family, either for good or for evil. But fathers have that special place and that power from God. You know, psychiatrists and sociologists have coined the term the father wound. And a lot of people are living today with the father wound. And it simply means, even whether your father was present or not. But last week we looked at the effects of, of no father in the home. And the father's the one. In other words, the father wound is where we have not been affirmed by our dad, our physical dad. And so affirmation comes. The scriptures are clear. The affirmation of who we are in our adulthood, our identity, okay, our sexuality, all those things come from dad. And that can't, that can't be... Um, minimized. So I want to take this a step further today. And I want to make this statement to you. And it's 100% true. And that is that every single struggle that you will ever have in life can be traced back to fatherlessness. Every struggle that we have in life is related to fatherlessness. Now, dads, we're not picking on you, okay? So you can sigh some relief here because it's not about you today. It's not about you at all. This is about something far bigger than you or me. We're talking about going all the way back to the Garden of Eden, where it all began, where the relationship between God and man was fractured. The place where God and the sons of God if you will, parted ways. And so Adam and Eve, and we, we read it there, we saw that when they sinned, what did they do? Did they confess their sin? Did they run to God with their sin? What did they do? They ran and they, they hid. They left home, if you will. And they ventured out on their own. They left home. And so by virtue of turning and running, and hiding, okay? So in other words, through, through their ignorance, Adam and Eve, mankind, became fatherless. They made themselves fatherless by turning their back on the father. And of course, the consequences of that have been nothing less than catastrophic. So <clears throat> my original thought, I really, the things I want to share with you this morning, my original thought that this would make a great series and maybe, maybe eventually we can do that. But I thought on the heels, because last week we talked about fatherlessness, and on the heels of that, I thought it would be good to at least take a peek at this issue and for you to understand fully what this means and all the ramifications of really what take place there. Because from the fall of man, the fall of man made everybody fatherless. All of us follow. You might have had a great father in your home and loving your physical father, but we're talking beyond that, something bigger. There's a void. Because in your heart, your spirit, when you come to God, your spirit is crying out, Abba, Father. See, you want your father. Everybody wants their father. And so when we don't have that, there are issues. And we're going to look at that this morning just briefly. Like I said, every one of these could have really been uh, a message of its own. And so from the portion of scripture that we just read, you can see that the serpent's intention in his interaction with the first Adam was to create separation, separation between God, between the Father, between the Creator, and his prized creation. That was his goal and his intention. Knowing full well, knowing full well that leaving the human race fatherless would have far-reaching and devastating consequences and it would leave roots and really what I want to do today is kind of take a look at the roots it would leave roots that have remained implanted in the hearts of men and continue to affect men today and what I want to do is show you those six roots of separation that could possibly 
still be affecting us today. So the attack on God's fatherhood began immediately in the conversation. So let's go back to verse 1. And just for time's sake, we're not going to look at all the verses again. But let's go back to verse 1, Genesis 3.1. Now the serpent was more crafty than the other wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from every tree in the garden? Okay, so that's a big scripture. That's why we got big. Okay, it doesn't even fit on the screen. It's a big scripture. So they came, and of course, there's a series of things that are going to happen. Now, let me just show you the first thing, okay? This is, what the, this is what's happening here. The very first thing, number one, is God cannot be trusted. That's the root of unbelief. God cannot be trusted. Let me just ask you a very simple question to see if this is possibly relevant to our day. Since you became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're here today, you love the Lord, you're committed to the Lord, you're following the Lord, okay, you want God's best in your life. Since you've been walking with God, has there ever been a time when you struggled to trust God with an area of your life? Anybody? Anybody? You struggled. Now, why would that be? Why would that be? Why would we have a hard time trusting God? Even with a strong belief overall in a, in a commitment to God, a trust in God. If there is a person who is all-knowing, all-loving, and all-powerful, why would I not trust him? Is God all-knowing? Is God all-loving? Is God all-powerful? It seems like that would be the person I'd want to put my trust in. And yet, you've attested, and I, can, and I have attested, we would still struggle. We would say, I struggle putting my faith and confidence in God. So even though we know those things about God, I find that I can still worry about my health. I can worry about my finances. I can worry about my loved ones. I can worry about my future. There's things I will worry about living almost as if there is not a father who's really looking after me. I'm almost living as if I'm fatherless. And, I, and that ability to trust, that ability when, when we know. You know, I was thinking, I was with my grandson. This was uh, a couple years ago. One of my grandsons. And he was, I don't know, maybe three, I'd say. And so, I don't know where we were. We must have been like at the playground. But we ended up in these bleachers. There were bleachers. And there was really nobody around. But we're in these bleachers. And he climbed up, not to the top, but near the top. And he was like on the, on the end. And so here I am standing off the side. And it's like, okay, okay, jump. He loves to jump, loves to, he's a kid, right? He's a boy. So I'm standing a couple feet away, and I'm like, okay, jump. Well, he'd have none of it. He's not interested in jumping. So I got a little closer to him, and I said, okay, jump. Well, he, he's not going to do it. He's not going to, I had to get right up and almost touch him to get him to jump. Why won't we jump? Why won't we jump? When we're talking about believing God for finances, for health, for increase, for things we need, why don't we jump? Is it that he can't trust Grandpa? There's something in him. You see, he didn't want to make the jump. If my father is untrustworthy, we're talking in our hearts, in our view, if my father is untrustworthy, I am essentially fatherless. I can live as though I don't have a grandpa. He's right there, ready, but I'm not going to go there, almost as if I don't have him. In Proverbs chapter 3, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Trust comes from your heart, not from your head. Trust is not about reasoning it out, or I've got to understand this. Trust is in where? Uh, where do we trust God? In our heart, with all of our heart. Now, you will not do well with trusting an absentee father. If, in your mind, God is distant, God is out there. I know God you know, is, is involved somehow, but he's out there. If he is distant to you, you will struggle trusting him right here, right now as a believer. Because he's absent. In your mind, he's absent. In other words, your heart, your heart is still going to be plagued by unbelief. But he is, praise God, church, he is ever with us. 
I said, he's ever with us. He's ever for us. And he's worthy of all of our trust. Okay, let's go to number two. I can be like God, which is the root of pride. Now we're going through this thing, and again, we're not going to visit every scripture individually like I'd hoped to, but for sake of time, because I want to give you the whole picture and then, and then tie it together. I can be like God. Now, of course, the interesting thing was Adam and Eve were created in the image and likeness of God. They were already like God, were they not? So there was something more sinister at play here. There was something beyond that. In other words, what was being presented to them, the temptation to them, if you will, is that um, there was a promise, there was an opportunity that they could be like God apart from God. And so that's what's behind this whole thing. This is a quest to be independent from God, thereby making God obsolete. In other words, to remove God entirely from the picture so he's no longer necessary to our existence. Now, if you're like me and you've ever gone through a prolonged time in your Christian walk of, I won't say prayerlessness, but maybe neglecting prayer, maybe not really spending time in prayer like you think you maybe should or would like to. If you've gone through a prolonged time of prayerlessness or if you've maybe gone through seasons in which Bible reading was just not there for you, we could dismiss that as I'm busy, there's other things going on in my life, um, and what have you. But would that not be the proof? Come on, let's be honest. Would that not be the proof that I'm really living as though I don't need God? I don't need that. We need God for salvation. We need God for eternal life. But beyond that, everyday life, I'm doing pretty good. I got a handle on this, right? I, I, I'm getting by fine. So I don't pray, I pray, I don't pray, it doesn't matter. I can do it. I seek God, it doesn't matter. I read the Bible, it doesn't matter. We see, we live in as though those things do not really have any influence or validity in my life. And so we can easily dismiss those things that I don't really need help from my father. So remember, Adam and Eve were already like God, but what the devil was really after, and this is what I'm going to present to you in just a minute here, what the devil is really after in a subtle way, and that's how the enemy works, what the devil really was looking for was for Adam and Eve to be like him. They were already like God, but they wanted, he, the, the devil was tempting them to remove God and be independent, but really what the devil was looking for is for him, them to be, mankind to be like him, being like Satan. So Isaiah tells us this. This is what was in the heart of Lucifer. And I'm reading from Isaiah 14. So this is God speaking. The whole thing was a set up, a, a lead in. You said in your heart about the enemy, I will send to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of the mount. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Now notice he makes a series of declarations here. And notice every one of them begins with the same word. What is it? I, ay, 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 right there. Evil, evil is embodied in self-centeredness, where it's all about me. I, in a proclamation of me and who I am. One of the amazing things, there's so many amazing things, but one of the amazing things about God is that everything in all of creation revolves around him. He is the center of all things in reality, whether people make him or not. He is the center of all things. And yet God is never self-centered or self-occupied. Never. God is always other person, other things minded. And so everything God does, everything he does is for the benefit of his creation. It's for the benefit of others. All the beautiful things we see in this world, the beautiful sunsets, the beautiful sunrises, the beautiful mountain ranges, everything that's of beauty, God said he created it for you and I. Everything he does, although he is the center of all things, 
He's not self-centered. He's characterized by this desire to bless others. Now, you and I, on the other hand, I expect the whole world to revolve around me. Right? Why aren't things going my way? Why aren't things happening for me? I was just in traffic the other day. There was a major delay there. And I'm sitting there saying, what is wrong? What is going on here? Don't they know I got to be somewhere? (laughs) Well, what was going on was construction. They were doing something for the benefit of everybody eventually, but it wasn't suiting me. And and life can be like that. We're kind of self-centered. And why isn't everything falling into place the way I want it to be? Now, the enemy's declaration is followed up by the word will. I will. So each one of those things says, I will. So it's self-centered. And then what's happening here? This is self-sovereignty. This is us um, wanting to express our own will, impose our own will, get our own way, wanting to be in control. Not only in control of my own life, I want to control circumstances. I want to control other people. If need be. In other words, if they're in the way. So this speaks of self-sovereignty. Not only of our lives, but of of, of anything else around us. In other words, the need to exert my will above everybody else's. This is one of the reasons we struggle in relationships. One of the reasons marriages are are, are so difficult at times. Because I want my own way. There's There's a quote that I love. This is by J. Vernon McGee, and he is a Bible teacher. And um, he, he says this. He says, this is God's universe, and God wants to have his way. You may think you have a better way, but you don't have a universe. Isn't that good? This is God's universe, and he wants his own way. You might think you should get your way, but you don't have a universe. In other words, God's saying, this is going to be my way because I own it. Okay, you don't own anything. You don't get to have your way. You get to submit to God's will, knowing that God's will is good and perfect and acceptable. Okay, so he says, I, again, what are we talking about? Here's the enemy. He's saying to them, "You you want to be like God? I can show you how to be like God. So here's what's in his heart, really. I will, and then he says, ascend. That's the glorification, not of God, but of, of our own self. God is the glorification of all things, but he remains forever humble. That's incredible. God, who's the one who should have the most, you know, God is the one who is glorified. God is the one who's above all things. If anybody should think highly of himself, it would be God, but instead he walks in humility. The God of all the universe. He's not proud. He is not self-centered. He is forever humble. At all times. And so we're going back to this fatherless thing. The scripture says, we talked about this last week. The glory of children are their father. So when dad's absent in your life, we're talking about the real father. When he's absent in someone's life, instead of glorifying him, the glory of every child is their dad. But if dad's not around, you glorify yourself. Self-glorification. It's fatherlessness that leads to that. Okay, number three, God is not enough to meet my needs. That's the root of idolatry. So when we're at home, when we're at home with dad, when we're close to dad, when we're living with dad, when we're with dad, he's everything we'll ever need. You know that. There's a peace, there's a joy. When you're, when you're close to God, he's everything you will ever need. When my kids were were young, when they were living at home, they had access to our whole house. They had access to everything there. Well, actually, now that they're adults of their own homes, they still have access to everything. They somehow think everything is dad's there still. But um, you know what I'm saying? So when we're close to dad, when we're living with dad and close to dad, everything he has is ours. But when we begin to feel fatherless, in other words, when God is distant, when God is not active, when God is missing, because we've, we've, we've like Adam and Eve, we've ran away, we're, we're in a different place. When we feel fatherless, we begin to ascribe power and influence to other things to fill that void. And that's the root of idolatry. And idolatry can take on many shapes, but at its core, 
at its core, it's a fatherless issue. You can't have God Almighty in your life. And Jesus said, you can't have God in your life and honor Him and worship money. Can't do that. Can't love God in man. It can't do that. If you're worshiping something or looking to something, it's because there's an absence. The Father's not there to be your dad. Now, you understand he is there, but we're saying in our thinking, he's not there. So idolatry could take in many shapes, but at its core, it's a fatherless issue. Number four, I want to get through this. Because this fruit looks good, it will be good for me. And that's the root of lust. Because it looks good, it'll be good for me. So lust, and many times we think of lust in terms of just sexual desires, but it's far, far more than that. It's not limited to just sexual things. At its, at its root, we're talking about the root of lust here, um, when something becomes, when something takes an inordinate place in my life, in other words, it becomes the focus of my longing, and I become convinced that without that thing in my life, I'll be incomplete. I've got to have that. I've got to have that, see? Then I begin to lust after it. It could be a person. It could be food. It could be possessions. It could be power. It could be a, a new position at work. But in my heart of hearts, I've determined that without that, see, my life isn't right. There's something missing in my life. Dad's not filling that. I've got to have this to fill that. I've got to have something else. And we want it because we think it'll do me good. The fruit looks good. We think it'll do me good, and it'll be the answer to my, to my struggles. It'll be the answer to my dilemma. And it, when, when you fall for that, you're chasing fool's gold. <laughs> it never works. Think, think about David's son, his oldest son, because remember he had a longing for his half-sister, and so he was lusting after his half-sister. And so with his cousin, he devises, uh, the boy with his cousin devised this grand scheme, and they convince the king, send, send her to see him. You can pretend he's sick. And so she, anyway, she comes, and he gets her there. Okay, this is what he's longing for. This is what he wants. He says he's deeply in love with her, and he rapes her. And after he rapes her, the scripture says that the hatred he had for her was greater than the love that he had for her. After he got what he wanted, after he got what he lusted for, it didn't do the job. And church, that's the way it's always going to be. When you lust, what you lust for has absolutely no ability to satisfy you. It's not going to do what it's dangling itself and saying it's going to do for you. It'll never work. So after getting her, what he had to have her, he decided he didn't want her at all. See, this is one of those things you have to be careful what you wish for deals because you might get what you are wishing for and then totally, totally wish you didn't get it. Okay, number five. This is a big one. And again, these, each one of these could be a, a message in its own and, could, and maybe eventually we'll go there. But I will be wise if I eat from the fruit of the tree. That's the root of deception. Have you ever tried to help someone who's in deception? A friend, you know, family member, whatever it might be. It is so difficult to get people out of deception because in their heart, they're convinced they know better. I know what I'm doing, and I'm doing this because it's the right thing to do. In other words, their attitude is, you can't tell me. That's their attitude. You can't tell me because I understand what I'm doing, okay, and I'm wiser than anybody else. So Jesus said this. Jesus said, if you hear what I have to say and then you do what I say, you'll be a wise man who builds his house on the rock. So when I hear the Father and I employ what the Father is saying to me, when I hear the Father's wisdom and I use that wisdom, I become wise. When I'm not doing that, when dad's distant, the word of God is distant, I'm not receiving the word of God, I'm not listening to dad, I'm not looking to dad, I am, in a sense, fatherless, because now I'm just trusting other things instead of dad. So when I am fatherless, I'm searching for other sources of wisdom, be it science, be it intellectualism, be it mysticism, be it Oprah or Dr. Phil. Okay, well, I'm searching for other ways to find this wisdom, which, of course, only leads to deception 
There's only one source of wisdom, and that is God himself. And so when we're living fatherless, we're then susceptible to becoming deceived, a root of deception. And then number six, there's six of them. There's six is the number of man, and all of these are affecting people. The last one here is, I will not die, which is the root of death. So disregarding God's warning, disregarding um, what God had told them, they bought the lie, and now death is integral to the human experience. Now, when we're talking about death, we're not just limiting that to the grave. You understand that. When we're talking about death, we're talking about sickness. We're talking about disease. We're talking about violence. We're talking about dysfunction. We're talking about fears. We're talking about all those negative things that are now prevalent in life and that people struggle with. It's, it's, it's all the result. It's, it's all death working in us. Since God is life, right? God is life. The absence of God is what? Is what? Is what? So when I don't have God, so we're talking about unregenerate man right now. If they don't have God, there's death at work because God is life. You receive God, you receive Christ, he is life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. So when you receive Christ, you receive resurrection life. You receive life. If you don't have God, then there isn't life. He that has the Son has life. He that has not the, the Son has not life. So a truly fatherless existence would be one in which there's no life flowing. I don't have the life of the Father. And that's where all life comes from. And so no life is flowing. And that becomes the problem. It's the root of death. And again, we're not just talking about our physical death. We're talking about there's death at work when the presence of God is not fully known and received in people's life. Now, I said this would be nothing but an introduction, but church, listen, what I want you to understand today, we're going to take communion together and let the Lord minister to us a little bit. But when dad is missing, when dad is distant, and I understand we all go through times when we don't feel as close to God as others, but in your heart of hearts, we talk about God is with us and God is for us and God will never leave us. You, and that, that is, so, yeah, I know God's with, no, do you know God is with you? He is your father and he is present. When you're there, you're at home. Adam and Eve left home. And that was the source of all the problems. When dad is missing in our life, we talked about physical fathers last week. But when dad is missing in our life, some or possibly a lot of these roots can be at play in your life. They can be active right now. And so we're rejoicing that we have a father who will never leave us or forsake us. Church, do you understand today you will never be fatherless? We can't make up for what maybe happened in your home as a child. But I'm telling you today, he is a good dad in your heart, you're crying out, Abba, Father, I want to be close to Dad, and Dad is as close as you will let him be. Let's take communion together with that thought. So the ushers and the guys that are going to help us come forward, if you would. And I want you to just be open today, because last week I think there was some healing taking place for some people as they, they looked at that fatherless issue. And what we really need to do right now, church, is understand be, it's way bigger than that. It's really bigger than your physical father. This is we're talking about the father, the father, the real father wound, where you feel that God has not affirmed you, where you feel that God has not been there for you. All those things that the enemy presented to them was to try to remove father from their life, their dad. He's with us. He'll never leave us. There is nothing, there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. There is nothing. Nothing can separate you. Dad is there. Dad is for you. 
Do not believe, do not believe the lie that God is not good because some good things have not happened in your life. God is always good. Your dad is always good. And he wants you to be close to him because if you're not close to him, then you're susceptible to some of these other roots exposing themselves in your life. We trust him. We trust dad with all of our heart. We're trusting him because he's good. He can be trusted. We have faith. We have confidence in God. We're walking in humility and not pride. We're not going to be like the devil. We're like our dad in heaven. He's the ultimate, ultimate, ultimate person of humility. Even though he's the center of all things, he refuses to be self-centered. And that's the way we're going to live. God is enough to meet our needs. We don't need anything else. We're not going to put our confidence in this world or in money or in things around us. We're not going to worship those things, give them power. God has all power. He's our dad. Because God is good to me, we don't have to live with lust. We're not lusting after other things. Dad is close. He satisfies all my needs. God is the root of our wisdom. It all comes from Him. We will not be deceived. Because Dad is here and we're looking to Him. We hear His word. We apply His word. And Jesus said that makes us wise. And there is no death working in us. Jesus said, I am the resurrection of the life, and he that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that lives and believes in me will never die. You can never die. Your body will give out, but you can never die. You're alive. And there's no death. That means no sickness and disease. That means there's all the negative things that weren't introduced are not a part of your life. There is no death. Death has no place in you. In the presence of God, he's fullness of life. We're just rejoicing today. We have a dad. We're not orphans. We have a father who loves us, who's committed to us, who's with us. And he can't be separated from us. You can choose not to think about him. You can choose not to honor him. You can choose to do things contrary to what you know to be the right thing. But all that does not change. He still loves you and he's there for you. And so we're committed. We, we have a dad. We're not going to live a fatherless existence. I said earlier, the root of every man's problem really is, goes back to that fatherless People either don't know God's their father or they're living like God is not their father. They're not willing to jump off the bleachers because it's a matter of trust. And we're saying, yes, God, we're trusting you today. We're trusting you. We've had some heartaches. We've had some setbacks. Every every person experiences those. But we know we come out on top. We know that we're more than conquerors through him who loves us. And so, hallelujah. So, let's take this communion. Father, we just want to thank you for the bread we hold in our hand. Jesus' body was broken to make us whole. We're whole today. We're part of the family of God. Behold what manner of love you've bestowed on us. You sent your son. And now we are called the sons of God. We're sons with him. And so we take this now, Lord Jesus, in remembrance of you. Let's take the bread. And then there's the cup, the cup that Jesus said was the cup of the new covenant. It was his blood shed for our forgiveness. Dad's forgiven you of everything, and you delight his heart. You belong to him. He called you, 
and he chose you. And we're taking this cup now. This is proof positive that our sins are forgiven. We belong to the family. Jesus was punished for all our sins. He was made sin so we could be made the righteousness of God in him. You're totally righteous today, church, and nothing can ever change that. It's God's gift to you, and it all came through the cross. Let's drink this now in remembrance of Jesus. Hallelujah. You can pass your cups to the end of the aisle. Let's have the worship team come on up, if you would, please. The worship team, come on up. And I'm going to ask you to stand with me right now. Would everybody stand, please? Let's minister to the Lord in song. Making sure, making sure today that your heart is just saturated with the love of a father. He's near you. He's near you. The scripture says he's nearer than a brother. He's closer to you than you ever imagined. And we don't perceive him in our senses. It's in our spirit, man. And we make that declaration. He is with us. He is for us. Because you need your father actively involved in your life. So you don't succumb to the things that we just mentioned here this morning. Let's minister to the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah, he's in the room. Every heart starts burning, and nothing matters more than just to sit here at your feet and worship you. Oh, come on, let's worship. He's he's in the room of your heart. He is right there. He's inside you. Hallelujah. Yes. Come on, we're worshiping him. Tell them how much you love them. And we'll never stop. We can't live without you, Jesus. We love you. And we can't get in. Oh, come on. Thank you, Lord. All oh, this is for you, Jesus. It's all, it's all about you, Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Jesus. You walk into the room, the dead begin to rise, cause there is resurrection life in all you do. We love you, yes, and we'll never stop. We can't live without you, Jesus. We love you. sing that one more time and the Lord has just put in my heart we're just singing about sickness sickness has no place in our life it's a part of death and there's no death working in you I want, to, I want to ask the elders to come forward ask the altar workers to come forward right now if you're struggling with a physical illness if the Lord is speaking to me this morning someone here has an ear problem I don't know if you just got an ear infection or whatever but an ear problem if you're here today, there's two things that came to me very strongly as we're singing that song now. 
some, someone's struggling with some major fear. It's almost terror. Or it's going to become terror if you don't deal with it. It's not from God. And he wants you to be set free right now. Any fear, terror. And if you are struggling where you just feel that rejection, you just you feel it's hard for you to connect with God an emotional level. It's hard for you to feel a part of the family, to feel a part of things. There just always seems to be something that makes you feel isolated. Dad wants you to be set free today. So we're going to sing it again. If any of those things are you, come on up. If you need healing your body, come on up. Let's minister to the Lord. No death is going to work in us. Hallelujah. Come on, let's sing it again. When you walk into the He's already walked in. He's here. Sickness starts to vanish. All sickness. It ceases to exist. Nothing's impossible. Walk into the Come on, nothing's impossible. The dead begin to rise. Come on up and get set free. Life in all you do. Dad is time. here. Dad is in the house. You walk into the room. Dad loves you. Every sickness starts to vanish. Dad is for you. Yes, thank you, Dad. When you walk into the room, the dead begin to rise because there is resurrection life in all you do. We love you. Yes, we do, Lord. And we'll never stop. We can't live without you. Jesus, we love you. Thank you, Lord. So good, so good. Come on, declare it. He's so good. Oh, to think where I would be if not for you. Oh, if not for you. You've been so, so good to me. He'll always be good. You've been so, so good to me. He can be nothing but good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Dad, we just thank you so much for all you've done for us.
making us a part of the family. Welcoming us into the throne of grace. Father, I pray for everybody here today. I thank you, God. They're not, they're not fatherless. And therefore, they're not susceptible to those roots. God, we bless you and thank you today for the price that was paid, for our redemption, for our salvation, so that we can truly be sons of God. We leave here today in the power of the Spirit. And Lord, we just pray that intimacy that you long for, that oneness with us, God, will be a part of our daily lives. Lord, we just love you. And we declare you are the best father ever. We owe everything to you. We can't live without you. We just need more and more of you. We bless you and we thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. I love you. The Lord loves you. Thank you so much for coming today. God bless you. Have a great day in the Lord. The Lord be with you.